Well, good evening. Let's stand together and sing Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Let the joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart, and my sins, which were many, are all washed away. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, there's a light in the valley of death now for me. Since Jesus came into my heart, and the gates of the city be I can see since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into
because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one that never salvation in a world that's left us cold can we get back to the altar back to the arms of our first love there's only one way to the father and he's calling out to us to the captive it looks like freedom to the orphan it feels like home to the skeptic it might sound crazy to believe in a God who loves In a world where our hearts are breaking And we're lost in the mess we made Like a blinding light in the dead of night It's the gospel, the gospel that makes a way It's the gospel that makes a way Cure for our condition is the good news for us all. It's greater than religion, it's the power of the cross. So can we get back to the altar, back to the arms of our first love? There's only one way to the Father, and He's calling out to us. To the captive, it looks like freedom. To the orphan, it feels like home. To the skeptic, it might sound crazy. To believe in a God who loves. In a world where our hearts are breaking, and we're lost in the mess we made. Like a blinding light in the dead of night. It's the gospel, the gospel that makes a way. gospel that makes a way. In my own life it means forgiveness when I know I deserve the fall. It called me out of my darkness and carried me to the cross. In a moment my eyes were open, in that moment my heart was changed. Like a blinding light in the dead of night, it's the gospel. Oh, to the captive it looks like freedom, to the orphan it feels like home. To the skeptic it might sound crazy, to believe in a God who loves. In a world where our hearts are breaking And we're lost in the mess we made Like a blinding light in the dead of night It's the gospel, the gospel that makes a way It's the gospel that makes a way It's the gospel, it's the gospel that makes a way have a word of prayer tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, that it is the, the power of the gospel, Lord, that is our hope, Lord. It's the power of, power of this message, Lord, that you so loved the world that you sent your one and only son to die on the cross for our sins and that he rose from the grave on the third day. Father, when we do what we do as a church, Lord, may we always come back to this central truth. 
Father, may we never stray from it, Lord, but simply go deeper into it. Father, help us, Lord, to grow in your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you got your Bibles, make your way to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Well, this past week, something wonderful happened. Live sports came back to television. Hallelujah. I was so excited, y'all. The, the opening night of Major League Baseball, I was excited. And I had watched a little bit of the, the summer league, the spring league, whatever they called it, getting ready. And they didn't have any any uh, fans in the stands, you know, and all that. And I kind of got used to that. And, and I thought, man, I'm going to really enjoy this. And uh, we're not going to, you know, it's just going to be something fun. Well, this week it's not been fun, has it? I, if you are on social media or if you watch the news, all they've talked about is kneeling, standing, uh, grabbing some black rope thing. I don't know what it was that they had going around and all those things. But, you know, uh, one thing that's been taken way out of context is the kneeling for the national anthem. Now, I watched the first game. Uh, or at least I watched the, most of the, the first few innings, I watched them before the, before the game started. They did not kneel for the national anthem. That's not true. Fox News has reported that they knelt for the national anthem. They didn't kneel for the national anthem. They knelt before the national anthem. And they all stood at attention with their right hands over their heart for the national anthem. And, you know, I told my families, we were sitting there watching, I said, well, I, you know, you make up your own mind about kneeling before and you know, grabbing that black rope, I don't know, and, and Black Lives Matter, and did they kneel to that, or stand for God, and all those things. But they stood at attention with their right hand over their heart and saluted the national anthem. That is untrue. And it's stuff like that that makes us leery of what we see uh, on the news. And so I'm t I don't know about the rest of the games, didn't see any of the rest of them, haven't watched them yet, but I will. I will watch my Braves whip Jerry McCarty's Yankees one day, all right? <laughs> And so, I, I mean, you know, I, I like sports. I don't watch sports for politics. I don't. I don't. I don't care what that guy pitching thinks about the president. Don't care. I watch sports so that I can enjoy it. I watch sports the same reason I watch Andy Griffith. I don't watch Andy Griffith because I want to find out, you know, what his political views were back in 1962. I'm not worried about that. I watch it to get away from that stuff. And so, you know, man, it's just, it's chaos, isn't it? So I'm going to make you a promise. You ready? We're not going to talk about politics anymore. Can I get a witness? Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Romans chapter 11. We're talking about the church on different subjects. What does the church have to say about different subjects? And tonight, and how appropriate that we sing that song, I, I hear the feedback a little bit, so I'm going to move back, and maybe, maybe that will stop. It's because of that speaker right there is what the, the issue is. But when they put it in and told me that that might happen, I said, was there any other place you can put it? Not... Not to get the best sound, they said. I said, well, I don't know what to do about that then. So we'll just try to stay out from under it. But uh, the last song that we sang, the gospel, how appropriate that we would sing that song before I preach what I'm going to preach tonight on God's grace. Me and Paul didn't get together. We didn't plan that. God works that out. Paul never knows what I'm going to preach before I preach. Uh, well, I can't say never, but very rarely. We don't get together during the week and say, this is the sermon. You pick out songs that go with the sermon. I much more enjoy it when God just works it out. And so that's exactly what he did. The church on God's grace. Look there with me in Romans chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 32. The Bible says, For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may have mercy on all. Now, now listen, that's important. That's important when you talk about God's grace. It's important when you talk about God's salvation. What's he done? He's imprisoned everyone under sin's law so that he might have mercy on all. He wants everyone to be saved. Say amen. That's a good place for it. He wants everybody to be saved. Will everybody be saved? No, some will choose not to be saved. But he wants his desire, his perfect will for their life is for them to be saved and come to an eternal relationship through Jesus Christ. So he's in prison all in disobedience so that he may have mercy on all. And then the Apostle Paul breaks out into song and says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has ever first given to him and has been repaid? 
For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the truth found here in your word. Father, help us to start looking at some of those unsearchable truths in your word tonight when it comes to your grace. Now, Father, it's a very simple truth that you love the world. But, Father, unpacking that sometimes can be difficult. So, Father, you help us tonight, Lord, as we look into your word for the next few moments. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Number one, the grace purpose. Now, I'm going to mention a word that sometimes just really scares Baptists, and it's the word election. The word election is in your Bible. If somebody asks you the question, do you believe in election, for you to say no means that you do not believe the Bible. The Bible teaches the word election, teaches the thought, and teaches the notion of election. Upon the very mention of this word, some begin to run and jump and bolt but election is a good word when understood biblically. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 talks about the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. It doesn't talk about the souls who were saved before the foundation of the world. And if you have a translation that says that, that is a bad translation of the text. It's not about the souls that were saved before the foundation of the world, but the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world so that souls might be Saved. Election is God's gracious action in choosing people to follow Him and obey His commands. And by the way, God has shown His election to be true throughout the Old and New Testament. You think about Abram. You think about Abram on the backside of nowhere, and God chooses Abram to be the father of Israel, to begin this great nation that God chose. And I've told you all this, and I don't like giving Him too much credit, but I'll give Roger credit for this. We were talking while we were in Israel. And, and, and you know, day after day, it, it, there's some beautiful places in Israel. Don't, don't misunderstand me. And when I know that Jesus' feet would, didn't walk the dirt I was on, but probably layers underneath me, but, you know, I'm closer there than I am here. When I, when I realize that, it's beautiful, right? I mean, it's wonderful. When we went to the empty tomb, the garden tomb, not, not the one in Jerusalem, if you went, but the one that is kind of outside of the old city of Jerusalem, uh, it, it, it takes your breath away. It takes your breath away to think that may literally be where his body lay. It takes my breath away. I, I, I mean, I, it, it, was, it was one of the most uh, exhilarating experiences that I had while I was there. The other one was the Sea of Galilee. When you're out on the Sea of Galilee, on the boat, you know, you know Jesus was here. Somewhere within sight is where he stilled the water. It took my breath away still does to think that I was I was there matter of fact I told my wife this week as I was preparing for the sermon this morning and talking about Mount Hermon I said you know what the greatest thing is about Mount Hermon he said what she said what I said I've been there I've been there blows my mind to think that I went to Israel still to, to this day it blows my mind that you know Lord may it be in 2021 I get to go back again it blows my mind but when you talk about God choosing that nation me and Roger would have conversation almost every day. Well, how would God choose this place? Out of, I mean, I've been, no, I've not been all over the world. I've not been. Some of you have been many more places than I have. But I've been a lot of places that's more beautiful than Israel. A lot of places. I'm going to be honest. Cleveland County is a lot more beautiful, uh, a lot richer, uh, has a lot more to offer than Israel. In a whole lot of ways. Why would God choose the nation of Israel. And Roger made this statement at some point uh, on the trip. He said, well, maybe, just maybe, God chose this nation because it had nothing to offer. It would force his people to look up to him. And oh, he doesn't go real deep most of the time, but that was pretty deep. That was pretty deep. That's pretty good. That's as good of an explanation as to why he chose that place. No, I'm just kidding. Roger's a very deep man, very wise we, we heard that, if y'all remember when we had Pastor Appreciation Day, y'all said some goofy stories about me, and then when you started talking about Roger, it was his wisdom, his wisdom, his wisdom. But that's a great statement. And maybe that's exactly why God would choose that deserted region for his people. Because it forced them to look up. By the way, they're still forced to look up. They still don't have a whole lot to offer, although God has blessed that nation, and we know that God has blessed that nation. But he chose 
those people. He chose Abraham. He chose him. How about Esau and Jacob? Jacob have I loved, or Esau have I hated, and Jacob have I loved. Why? By his sovereign choice. Simply by his sovereign choice. And so we're going to talk about God's, uh, the grace purpose, the purpose for his grace. Election confirms that the Lord is the innovator when it comes to salvation. He created salvation. It's not based on the Baptist faith. It's not based on what Brother Doug thinks. It's based on God, simply based on God. He created it. He uh, made the, the uh, invention of salvation, if you will. Salvation is his plan. It's not on my terms. It's not my plan. You know, when people make this statement, I know I need to be saved, and I'll be saved one day. Well, maybe you'll be saved one day. God's will and desire is for you to be saved. And if you know you have a need of salvation, then today is the day of salvation. But there may come a day where you'd like to be saved, and God's Spirit is not drawing you to salvation. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, the Lord Jesus says, Likewise also the cup after, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. It's His plan. Just as God chose the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, so God has chosen to set up this new covenant with you and with I if we come to Him. It's His plan, and grace is His purpose. Uh, the Lord put this all into existence. The Lord wrote the book, so to speak, or literally, right? He wrote the book on salvation. John chapter 6, you know what Jesus said, everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up in the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Therefore, the Jews started complaining about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can we now say, how can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, stop complaining among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Uh, the Lord is the one who does the drawing. Now, you need to know what that word draw literally means. Drag. The Lord is the one who does the dragging. Now, we're going to get to man's free will. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But the Lord is the one who does the dragging. He is the one who does the drawing. He is the one who is the initiator in salvation. When I got saved as an eight-year-old boy, I didn't get saved because I just woke up one day and said, you know what? Everything that's been taught to me from birth just sounds good. It sounds right. It sounds like it makes sense, and I'm going to trust in that. It wasn't that way at all. As a matter of fact, I remember as a little boy listening to sermons, and none of it made sense to me. I mean the Old Testament stories, David and, the, and Goliath, and the, you know, I talked about this morning, the, the stone, and I mean, that was a fun story, but to say that that was true, the Jonah in the big fish, we called it a well when I was growing up, and we don't know what kind of, but it was a big fish, Jonah in the, I'm going to call it a well, all right, everybody okay with that? Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the big fish. It's a great story. It was a fun story. I mean, the flannel graphs were awesome, right? But to say that I understood it, no. No. The story of Father Abraham, how many sons? How many sons had Father Abraham? You sang the song too, didn't you, right? Uh, it was a good, fun song. It's actually an annoying song is what it was. But, but did I understand who Father Abraham was? No. No. Not until God began to deal with me about my sin. And all of a sudden, church became not a fun place to go. It wasn't a country club. It was terrifying. Because God was drawing me to salvation. Now listen, to draw a soul to salvation is to show that lost soul that they are lost. And when I came face to face with my lostness, 
And I wanted to know God's grace purpose for my life. I want to know. I want to know how can I be saved. Begin to ask a lot of questions. As a kid, how can I be saved? I, I had a desire for him, but it wasn't because I had a desire for him. It was because he first loved me. The grace purpose, the reason for God's grace, it's all based on him, and it's him doing the dragging. It's him doing the drawing of the soul toward Himself. You remember in the main text in Romans chapter 11 how unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. When it comes to God's grace, you ever wondered why? You ever wondered why God begins to work on the heart at different moments in life? I, I know a man can be saved in his 80s and God's been drawing him or dragging him or trying to get him to uh, the gospel that we sing about. All his life. I, I do know that. But I know men and women who have been saved later in life that never really were confronted with the true gospel until later in life. Uh, sometimes it's because there's a church that, that they grew up in that didn't preach the truth. Uh, when I was a youth minister, I had a lady, who, she was a mother of one of the children. She came to me and she said, Brother Doug, I need to be saved and, I, and then I want to be baptized. I said, you're, you're a leader of my youth group. And, and you won't be saved, now you won't be baptized, so tell me your story. You're, you're already a member of the church. She said, no, I'm not. My name is on the church roll, but I am not a member of the church. When she was growing up in, in Bible school, I think I've shared uh, a story very similar to this, if not this story, of you know the pastor at the end of Bible school, how many of you kids won't get baptized? Come up here to the front row. Gave them all a card. They checked the box. They wanted to get baptized. She walked up and got baptized. Never once. Did anyone talk with her about a relationship with Christ? Now that's how number after number after number of Baptist churches, that, that's how they worked it. I've got an uncle that'll tell you in his testimony that uh, when, when the pastor gave the invitation, came up, and the pastor asked, the pastor asked him the question, are you ready to make that decision? Yeah, I'm ready to make that decision. All right, sit down. Next thing you know, he's being in the, you know, introduced into the baptistry of the church. He never made that decision. Nobody ever told him how to make that decision. So he was in college. By the way, he's now a Baptist preacher. But he was in college when he found a relationship with Jesus Christ. How will they believe if they don't hear? And so sometimes I, I really believe that God... Waits until a man is old before he ever really begins to draw the heart. Now, I don't know why. I don't know why. And it's not for me to know. On Sunday mornings when I preach, don't you think that I can look out sometimes and think, well, that boy needs to get saved. That lady, she, she really needs to get saved. I know, I know their heart. We have visitors, now. we didn't today, but we have visitors a lot of times that I talk to. I know their heart. I know what they'll tell you about salvation. We have visitors sometimes that visit our church that tell you they don't even believe there is a God. And there's times that, you know, I look out and think, God, why, don't, why not today? Why aren't they getting saved today? Now, because they don't get saved does not mean that God's not drawing them to salvation, but sometimes that's exactly what it means. I can't explain his overall total purpose of grace other than this, God has a desire to save every lost soul on planet Earth in 2020. Right now, everybody on, in 2020 on planet Earth that's walking upright right now, he wants to save. He wants to save. That is a part of his perfect plan. All right, the grace purpose. Number two, the free will of man. The free will of man. Now, we all have free will. You had free will this afternoon, and some of you fought against a flesh and said, I'm not staying at home, I'm going to go to church. No, no show of hands, please, all right? It, but some of you thought, I could just stay at the house. It's hot outside, I'm going to get outside, I'll just hang out at the house. But you chose by your own free will to come here. God did not force you to come here tonight. Some people are watching online. Some people are not watching online. They're making decisions. Free will decisions. You make decisions all throughout the day. Decision of what time to get up, 
decision of what to eat for breakfast. There's free will in your life in almost every area of your life. And by the way, that includes your salvation. It also includes your work for Christ after you are saved. You have a choice. We have free will. We talked about Abram or Abraham earlier. And in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, the Bible says, And in thy seed shall, this is God speaking, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. So God chose Abram, but then Abram chose God. He made a decision. And because of his decision, because of his free will choice to choose to follow after God, then God says the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have chosen to obey me. And by the way, especially for the men in the room, you choose to follow God and God will choose to bless your family. You choose to be obedient to God and be surrendered and sold out to him and God will sovereignly choose to bless your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren. You say, well, I didn't serve him all my life. Well, start today. I mean, surrender today and say, from this day forward, I can't do anything about the past except be forgiven. From this day forward, I'll choose to serve you. C.H. Spurgeon is quoted as saying, and by the way, he's quoted as saying a whole lot of things. So, you know, kind of up in the air on some of those quotes. But he's quoted as saying this. I am not sure that in heaven we shall be able to know where the free agency of man and the sovereignty of God meet. But both are great truths. Now, I disagree with that statement because the Bible says that when we get to heaven then we will not only know Christ, but we will know as Christ. And I figure Christ understands how those two things add up. But I do understand the thought in Spurgeon's statement that it's so far above what you and I can either think or believe or hope to believe uh, that God is sovereign and totally in control and man has total free will. It's hard to explain, isn't it? It's desperately hard to explain, but it, it, they are both true. So... I want to prove to you by God's word that God is sovereign. You know this. You believe that God is sovereign. But in John chapter 15 and verse 16, the Bible says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit, and that your fruit should remain, should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, I will give you. Acts chapter 13 and verse 48 says this, When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced, and glorified the message of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. Did you hear that? All who had been appointed to eternal life believed. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30 says this, And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9 says this, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14, But we must always thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit through belief in the truth. He called you to this through your gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our God is sovereign. He is in charge. He is on the throne. He is moving. He is working. And if anyone gets saved, it started with him. My salvation is to his glory, not to mine. Now, I'm grateful for my salvation. And certainly in my own life, it's caused a change in my life because I am saved. But it's not based on who I am. It's totally based on who he is in me. Uh, God is sovereign, but man is free. Let me give you some verses for that. John chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 says this, So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John chapter 5 and verse 24, I assure you, anyone who hears my word, by the way, this is Jesus, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to 
life. Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe with all your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. Now the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Revelation 22 and verse 17 is the greatest example of man's free will. Both the spirit and the bride say what? Come. Come, anyone who hears should say come, and the one who is thirsty should come. Whoever desires should take the living water as a free gift. So God is sovereign, but man is free. I had a, uh, a young man, and I got to be careful because he watches these sermons, but he wanted to join the church that I was a pastor of. Not this one, but another church. And I said, okay. He said, but I want to take you out to dinner, and I want to talk about it. So I knew it went deeper than, hey, man, I, I think I'd like to be a part of the church, right? We sat down, and we had dinner, had a great conversation. This, this young man was not only was he uh, very active in the church already, that he was one of the leaders in Awana. Uh, I mean, he was, he was just an active participant in church, period. After we ate, he said, Preacher, i got to tell you something. He said, I know you're not, but I, I am a five-point Calvinist. And I said, well, awesome, man, awesome. And we began to talk about Calvinism and why I don't believe in all five points of Calvinism and why I would never claim myself to be a Calvinist or an Arminian because I'm not going to call myself after anybody but Jesus Christ. And we talked about that. We talked about the places where we agree. We talked about the places where we disagree. And by the way, there's a lot we disagree on. He said, well, can I be a member of your church? I said, well, maybe. He, he said, what do you mean, maybe? By the way, I was asked that same question this last week. And I said, well, maybe. Maybe. You know, we're not open to everyone being a member of Westside First Baptist. There's qualifications, right? Are you born again? You know, that's, that's question number one. Have you been baptized by immersion in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? That's question number two. Question number three is why were you baptized by immersion in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit? You should not have to ask that question, but now you better ask that question because some people were baptized so they can go to heaven. And so question number one is not a correct answer. If you were baptized so you can go to heaven, you're not going to heaven. Because we are saved by grace and by grace alone. So we got through those two questions and that absolutely he answered them correctly. And I said, well, here's my, here's my next question. If one of those little boys, little girls comes to you, calls you by name, Mr. Blank, he says, I'd like to be saved. What are you going to tell him? And here's what he said. He said, I'm going to tell them the gospel of how Jesus died for their sin, how on the third day he arose from the dead, and if they would call on his name, they could be saved. I said, then the answer is yes. You can be a member of the church that I pastor. Somebody's calling. I was in a revival one time, and the pastor made some. I try not to do that because I watch this in person. And the, pastor, the, the evangelist made some kind of dumb statement about a phone ringing answer it, it better be God, you know, something like that. And finally, somebody in the church kind of raised their hand, and he said, what? He said, I think it's your phone, preacher. <laughs> so I don't say much about it, because it could be my, it's not, if my phone's in my office right now, I don't even bring it in here. But for that reason, by the way, I went, well, that, let's, let's make sure that never happens, right? But I told this young man, I said, absolutely, you can be a member of my church. We can disagree on some theology, but we've got to be right on the gospel. We've got to know that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can and will be saved. Now, I can't explain God's sovereignty and, and man's free will. And by the way, I don't even struggle with it anymore. I just believe that man is free and I believe that God is sovereign. I believe when I preach, the Spirit's going to work on hearts. And not everyone's going to choose to believe in him. But boy, the ones who do, God would choose them for salvation. I believe predestination exactly how the Bible teaches it, that once we are saved, we are predestined to be conformed into the image of His Son. 
Not predestined before the foundation of the world. Lost people are not predestined for hell and saved people predestined for heaven. No. But once you are saved, you are predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. That's why when the preacher talks about salvation and says if there's been no change, there's been no Jesus. It's biblical to make that statement. So you've got the, the purpose of God's grace. And then you've got the free will of man. Spurgeon has also been quoted as saying this. Election to a saint is one of the most stripping doctrines in all the world. Now, you listen to what he says here. To take away all trust in the flesh or all reliance upon anything except Jesus Christ. How often do we wrap ourselves up in our own righteousness and array ourselves with the false pearls and gems of our own doings? We begin to say, now I shall be saved. Because I have this and that evidence. Instead of that, now listen to this last line. It is naked faith that saves. That faith and that alone unites to the Lamb, irrespective of works, although it is productive of them. Let me explain what he says there at the end. He could have said that a lot easier, right? Remember, he's Old English. What he says there at the end of the naked faith that saves, that faith and that alone unites to the Lamb irrespective of works. I've been in churches. It's probably happened in this one. I don't remember a time, but it probably has. Where we could mention someone and their need for salvation and someone else would say, well, I mean, we pray for them, but I don't think that person ever gets saved because of what they've done. I can't tell you everything that members of your church have done in the past because I've been asked not to. But I can tell you this. I can't think of a sin that has not been done by someone as a member of this church at this time. Everybody okay? Yeah, that includes murder. Sure does. Sure does. Sexual promiscuity, absolutely. Absolutely. Homosexual tendencies. Yep. Idolatry. Oh, yeah. And we've all been guilty of that. Liars. Thieves. As the song that the sidewalk prophet sing, it's a motley crew of misfits. That's who we are. Hey, and can I just say, I don't want pastor a church that doesn't have a membership role looks a lot like that. I, I've heard story after story after story. And, and you walk away. I do as a pastor because I, I know, especially those who are, who are later in years, I'll put it that way. Is that okay to say later in years? They're old, okay? Can I just say that? They're old folks, all right? They're older, and, and, and I've known, since I've known them, they, you know, they've been serving the Lord. And you sit down, and you hear some of the stories of the past, and you go, are you kidding? Really? really? It, it, it's, it's almost unbelievable because of the difference that God has made in their life. But I can look at my own life, and if I just told the story, I just told Ron the story of, of meeting one, my baseball coach when I was in high school. I met him in a, a, in a restroom at a regional basketball tournament. And, and I looked at him and I thought, that's Coach Little. He'll never remember who I am. And so we were washing our hands. He was at this sink. I was at this sink. I said, Coach Little, I bet you don't remember who I am. He looked. He stopped washing his hands. He looked at me, Junior, and he said, Enzer, how could I ever forget? And he goes back down and starts washing his hands again. And I went, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, you're kind of unforgettable too. Co no, I didn't say that. But I said, I said, Coach, you won't believe, you will not believe that I am now a Baptist preacher. He stopped washing his hands again. He looked at me and said, yep, you're right. And he walked out of the restroom. <laughs> you know why? Because when I was a junior and a senior in high school, I wasn't a preacher. By the way, I don't know many junior and seniors who are. 
When I was on the, the base, can I, t- I don't know if I can even say this from the pulpit, so I'm going to get up here in front of it. What, my ninth grade year, when we took our team picture, I was the only one in the team picture had a chew of tobacco. And, and it, you could practice baseball, you couldn't, not football, but you could practice baseball, you could, you could chew tobacco. And I, you know, I was a big man. I was chewing that Levi Garrett. And we put on our uniforms and took our picture. And when the coach saw it, he called me in his office. He said, son, we don't care if you do it during practice, but you've got to spit that out. That's going in the annual. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. I said, is my mama going to see that? He said, yes, she will. I said, I am dead meat. That's what I am. That stuff like that's why it's hard to believe. You see, God's grace changes everything. I've told y'all, I, I used to chew tobacco. It started in baseball. But God's grace has made a difference. You say, well, that's really, you know, that's not that big a deal. No, it is too. It is too. It's huge. I feel the same way about chewing the back as my grandfather used to feel about smoking. He would almost weep when he talked about smoking. When he was in Germany drinking beer because he couldn't drink the water. That's all they could get. He would almost weep every time he talked about it. And I asked him one time, I said, Papa, why do you always, you cry when you talk about it? He said, I can't imagine how my Heavenly Father felt as I was living that way. God's grace. Man, it makes a change. It makes a change. His purpose and grace is to save the soul and to change the old sinner. Amen. Point number three is the enduring servant. And by the way, when I say enduring servant, I really mean enduring Savior. Look over in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Just flip over there in your Bible. I want you to see these words. You've heard them so much, but read them once again. Romans 8, beginning in verse uh, 28. We read these earlier. We know that all things work together for good of those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. But listen, it goes on. And what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How we, excuse me, how will we not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As as it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth, or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I believe in eternal security of the believer, not because it's a Baptist thing, but because it is a Bible thing. It's a promise of God. That if I place my faith and trust in Him, He'll never leave me. He'll never turn me loose. He'll never walk away. There's no sin that I can commit that is unpardonable. But He'll love me, not just for that day. Not just on the day of death, but for all eternity. My eternal life began as an eight-year-old boy the moment I gave my heart to Jesus. Your eternal life began the very moment you believed. Eternal security. We are protected by God's power. First Peter chapter 1 says this. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading. Listen, kept 
in heaven for you. You are being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time or the last days. We're protected by his power. Eternal life is in Christ. John chapter 5 and verse 24, the Lord Jesus said, I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. It will not come under judgment, but is passed from death to life. By the way, John 5, 24, that's the verse I read. Every person whom I lead to Christ, John 5, verse 24, immediately after. You've passed from judgment into eternal life. When? In that moment. In that very moment. We can know that our salvation is secure. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 11 through 12. For this gospel I was appointed a herald, apostle, and teacher, and that is why I suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, because I know the one I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. We can know that we're never forsaken. Hebrews chapter 13, your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I'll not be afraid. What can man do to me? We know that God will finish this work. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's not based on me holding on to him. It's based on him holding on to me. By the way, one of the points of the five points of Calvinism is perseverance of the saints. I do not believe in perseverance of the saints. I believe in perseverance of the Savior. Because if I've got to hold on to him, I'll do a poor job. If I've got to just keep pushing till the end, I'll fall short of the finish line. I know me. I know me. I know what I'll do. But if he's holding me, I know what he'll do. If he's seeing me through to the end, then to God be the glory. He is faithful. 2 Peter chapter 1 says this, verses 10 and 11, and we're done. Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Because if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly supplied to you. The question is not, can he hold? We know he can. The question is not, will he hold? We know he will. The question is not, will God save you? Because we know he will. The question is, are you saved? The question is not, were you saved? It's, are you saved? How many of you read that little book, Whatever Christian Ought to Know by Adrian Rogers? We gave a bunch of those out. I hope you read that. I hope you read the chapter. And if you need one, we may have some around. But uh, if you've if you not read it, you, you need to read. It's a great book. There's, there's a chapter on eternal security. And in that chapter, Dr. Rogers makes this statement. The question is not, have you been saved? The question is, are you saved today? And he talks and gives kind of a biographical account of how he was wrestling with this idea of, am I really saved? Did I really get it right? And Satan was whispering in his ear. And he said, finally, he had to come to grips with, it's not was I saved when I was an 8-year-old boy or a 12-year-old kid or a teenager or in my 20s or in my 30s or last week. The question is not, have I been saved? The question is, am I saved? Do I know Christ today? And that's not a question of eternal security. It's a question of eternal knowledge. If you've trusted in Christ, you're secure. Oh, Satan, he's, he's cunning, isn't he? He'll come and whisper in your ear. He'll bring up something you did 30 years ago. Something you hadn't thought about in years. You, 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 you'll go to bed tonight and you'll dream about it. Wake up, just like it happened. And you go, golly, gee, I did that. No way God could love me. No, you're right. If it wasn't for grace, there's no way he could love you. But you remember what grace is. 
It's an unmerited favor. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's all to Him we owe. My sin, it left a crimson stain, but He washed it white as snow. Not when you got cleaned up you came. No, you came when you were dirty. And, and, and by the way, left to yourself, you're still dirty. You still need a Savior. I saved at the age of eight. I'll be 40 this year. We got a letter in the mail that said, Good news, your health insurance is going up because you're getting old. My wife ran into that bedroom with that. She couldn't wait to read that to me. But I'll be 40 in, in, in November, and I need Jesus just as much today as I did the moment I trusted him. And by the way, I do trust him. Like jumping off a cliff, man. Pandemics, riots, feasts, and famine. I trust him. You say, Brother Doug, boy, it's awful simple. Yep. Yep. And if I'm wrong, I'll pay the price. But if I'm right, I'll live for all eternity with him. And by the way, it's not based on whether I'm right or not. It's based on whether he is. And if he's lied to us, then he'll have to answer when I see him. But if he's told us the truth, I'll have nothing to answer for when I see him. Because my sins, because of his grace, have been separated as far from me as the east is from the west. So what does the church say about God's grace? Oh, it's good. <laughs> it's good, and I'm grateful for it, aren't you? Let us never forget that we are what we are and who we are by the grace of God. I'm breathing air tonight by the grace of God. And when I die and go to heaven, I'll die and go to heaven, but by the grace of God. I'm thankful for grace. Thankful. I can't explain it all. I can't explain it all. But I can promise you this. If you're in this room or you're watching online and maybe you even watch two years from now, you'll watch this video from when it first went out. That if you choose to trust him, he chooses to save you. He's promised to do it. Let's bow our heads for a time of prayer and invitation. Maybe you hear a message like this. And you say, boy, I'd just like to tell the Lord thank you for saving me. And then use this time of invitation just to tell him, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I don't deserve it. I deserve to go to hell, but because of your grace, I've been saved. Maybe you won't come and kneel in the altar or do business where you are, at home or in this room. Don't know. Maybe you're in this room and you say, Brother Doug, I need to be saved. I, didn't, I don't have it right. Then let's get it right. Maybe you're watching online. You say, boy, I need to be saved. I wish somebody helped me. Well, we would. You just got to let us know. And there are multiple ways to do that online. We love to talk with you about a relationship with Christ. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your wonderful, beautiful, glorious grace. Thank you for the gospel, the good news that you sent your son. Lord, I thank you for election. It's not based on me. It's based solely on you. But Lord, I thank you also for the truth of free will, that you gave me a choice. You didn't force me into salvation. You don't force anyone into salvation. But you give them a choice to choose to believe. And Lord, that's what love is. And so, Father, thank you for giving us the love of your grace. Now, Father, tonight, during this invitation, you move as you see fit. Lord, I've preached on you drawing, you moving in hearts. And Father, you can move in hearts where it's needed tonight. I give you praise, honor, and glory for it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing. If you need to come, you come.
your prayer that in our life and our homes and our church everything we do may god be honored and may god be glorified amen i hope you have a great week this week we will have prayer meeting uh wednesday night right here in the sanctuary at six o'clock come be a part uh of that paul's teaching the youth downstairs every wednesday night so uh teenagers don't forget about that is that everything that needs to be announced no more baby showers i kept forgetting to announce baby showers I, f- I felt very guilty for forgetting to announce baby showers because I'd go home and my wife would tell me how I forgot to announce baby showers. Storehouse Food Pantry, Wednesday. This is the fifth Wednesday of the month, so we need some help this Wednesday from 9 to 11 uh, down at the storehouse. All right, anything else needs to be announced? All right, we're going to dismiss differently. Don't sneeze. <laughs> we'll all run if you sneeze. We're going to dismiss differently. You are dismissed.